and that's exciting news that's coming up, coming up in, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, four and a half days. So the 5th of June, if you are interested in heading over to NASA TV, you can view the transit of Venus across the face of the sun uh, for the only time in the next hundred or so years. So you might enjoy doing it. Someone in the Justin TV science chat that we were doing uh, said that, uh, well, there are rare things happening all the time. I hear the echo again. Sorry. Oh, okay. I was like, wait, uh, <laughs> did I, did I, do I have an echo like last week? What's going on? Um, I had the YouTube page open when I was getting the link to put it in IRC window. Right in the uh, IRC chat. Good. And it cool. finally started actually streaming from YouTube. Nice. We are streaming live. Oh. Um, yeah, if you want to join us in the chat room, probably uh, everyone in there right now is from the Justin TV hour that we did, you can go to webchat.freenode.net if you're using a web browser. If you're using an IRC client, you can go to irc.freenode.net and the channel is Science Chat. Science Chat, because that's what we do. We chat, we talk. <laughs> Fox in the Wires is saying he still wants to form a band called Transit of Venus. I think that could be a very good band name. My favorite band name that I came up with a couple of years ago, Lasers from China. That's my favorite band name. Uh, For removing weeds? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for removing weeds, exactly. So um, there was, let me see if I can find the story. It's uh, just a popular science story um, that I think was called from Forbes. Uh, some people are working on, um, on lasers. Lasers, yes, using labor lasers to kill weeds. And they were laughing, pew, 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 kill the weeds. It would just burn... The, uh, the weeds, the root system, so that they would die. It is, they just couldn't stand still long enough with a magnifying glass. <laughs> so they went to a laser. Right. <laughs> I think that's a funny idea. <laughs> I'm just going to use a magnifying glass. That could take a while. It wouldn't take very long if you use a big Fresnel lens. But then you'd burn off everything off the grass, not just the weed. Yeah, then you'd be... Um, then that would be a fire. <laughs> the then, you would, then you'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I love magnifying glasses, Fresnel lenses, magnifying, focusing the power of the sun. Was there? Did you ever? Did you hear about that? Um, uh, what was it? The. Uh, hotel in Las Vegas that supposedly was burning people a while back that because of the curvature of the uh, the side of the building it at a certain time of day it was basically focusing the light of the sun down into the pool area and it was really hot so it was increasing the way it was uh, focusing the sun reflecting the sun it was a really really hot, not like a death ray or anything like that, but actually just made it very uncomfortable in the pool area during certain hours of certain days of the year. It is ringing a bell, but I don't remember my details. Yeah, I think people were talking about, oh, it was going to, it was, they were talking about, oh, it's killing people or causing blisters and, you know, in seconds and going off the deep end about what was actually happening, but... Um, Let's see, Identity4 in the chat room is saying, I don't know about a hotel, but the Disney Concert Hall in L.A. had that problem. <laughs> That's not good. Was it just Death Ray, or was it uh, just, I don't remember that story either. Just it, when you have something that will reflect the sun, and maybe if you have a, a bend in the building, so that the sun is reflecting off of multiple parts of the building into a single point, that's when you potentially run into run into trouble. Oh, the sun. 
I love it. Yeah, Death Ray says Identity 4. It was curvy and made of shiny metal. <laughs> and then they put, they just put black tar over, over that building. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. We have a few, a few people joining up in the chat room. Awesome. Join, join, chat, chat. That's what we want to do, science chat. Let me check over on the YouTube page and see how things are going over there. There's so many different places for me to check these days to see comments or, that people are making. Oh, well, just more places where you have to put the uh, web chat info. Yeah. So Kiki, there's a recent story about evolution of birds as a result of a change in how dinosaurs developed. Oh, yeah, I, I saw that. I saw that story. That one I thought was interesting. Um, so you're going to say your doctorate is in baby or, br baby dinosaur brains? <laughs> baby dinosaur brains. <laughs> Juvenile dinosaur brains. Exactly. The, uh, was it, in, it was a really interesting, uh, interesting study. I mean, part of me, I, I like it because they're using physical character. They're, what they were doing, they're looking at physical characteristics. They looked at the skulls uh, and the, the skeletons of uh, modern birds and, uh, and extinct dinosaurs that are known to be ancestors of birds, so the theropod dinosaurs. Um, looked at the, the, the skulls and by looking at adults, juveniles, um, and babies of all sorts of different species from, you know, 250 million years ago or so, I mean, they're looking really far back historically, um, and comparing them against modern birds, they found that the traits that modern birds have in their skulls, the characteristics of the bones and where muscles attach and all that kind of stuff, it really looks like the characteristics of juveniles, juvenile dinosaurs, not adult dinosaurs. And what they surmise from this is that certain species within the theropod dinosaurs um, went through something called progenesis. And progenesis is where you speed up your development. So instead of taking years like humans do to reach adulthood, um, it would be like humans all of a sudden became adults at the age, uh, you know, instead of becoming adults at the age of, you know, I don't know what you would consider adult adult, but um, in their 20s or 30s, it would be like humans suddenly becoming adults much younger, like when they're six or seven, and having those characteristics locked in as the adult characteristics. Um, and so it's a really, it, it potentially leads a lot of directions for researchers who study birds and who are paleontologists to be able to ask questions about the biology of uh, extinct animals to um, ask uh, ancestral questions. How did different species split into the ones that we see now? Um, the thing that bugs me though is that there's always the question now that we have genetics of okay so these are the physical characteristics but what's really going on in the genes and do you do you still see the same uh, same pattern within the genes or are you know is there something completely different going on because very often with birds especially we we have this whole family tree of how birds are related and then we go and do genetics and we're like oh that species isn't re actually related to that species it just looks like that species because before genetics all relatedness was determined based on how things looked and we were wrong a lot of the time we're still wrong a lot of the time Makes you think about the one uh, rodent-sized, like groundhog-sized creature that's closely related to elephants and hippos, was it? But it's not mm -hmm. where it looks like it should be related to something smaller. Right. I don't remember what it was, but it was from a couple weeks ago. I don't remember that one. There's also, um, you know, there's always the, I've gotten it wrong a few times because I, for, I, I forget, but... Um, bats which look like rodents which look like mice and rats that they're not actually really closely re related to mice and rats they're not bats are not rodents 
not. You might want to think they are, but they're not. It doesn't happen. So the Joker was wrong whenever he called Batman a flying rat? Yeah, <laughs> he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he was wrong. Joker! This is why we need things like the Science and Entertainment Exchange so that you can have a science advisor on movies like Batman to make sure that lines are more correctly attributed. Well, they would have needed okay. it a long time ago for the comic books long before they got to the movies. Yeah. Oh, everybody in the chat room is talking about Prometheus right now. People saw Avengers last weekend... Prometheus this weekend. Everybody is so excited. And here I am. I don't think I'm ever going to go to a movie theater ever again. <laughs> That's not true. No, it's not true. When Kai gets older, you'll go out and watch family movies and instead of the movies you wanted to watch. <laughs> I know. It's a good thing I like animated films. Pixar is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, so this change to form to mature more quickly in uh, birds versus yeah. the dinosaurs would be yeah. the defining change that allowed them to survive the mass extinction 65 million years ago? Since, Possibly. Since uh, you wouldn't really have the opportunity to mature for several years before breeding after an asteroid impact. Right, so maybe that was what uh, the the quicker maturation time, the progenesis that happened, maybe it's what led to the success of birds and the fact that we have birds on the planet at all. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. It's very so interesting. The, and then progenesis in humans would make hobbits. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not necessarily the hairy-footed kind, but, uh, yeah. Short. But, I mean, if you could imagine, like, I don't know, my kid, Kai, all of a sudden, fully mature. Like, now. With his little wobbly walk. Yeah. So we would be little people. We would not be as... We definitely wouldn't be as tall, because we wouldn't have as long to grow. We would have a lot of... Uh, juvenile characteristics, maybe uh, bigger eyes, more... Uh, more temper tantrums. More temper tantrums. <laughs> oh, that's a, it, that would be really interesting. Then I Lars wonder, would be running around with plastic guns saying, I got you, I got you. Yeah, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Who knows? And, and you know, an, an interesting point to go jump off here is like when we talk about adulthood, usually what is meant by that is um, sexual maturity. So what we say differentiates juveniles from adults is um, reaching sexual maturity, the ability to have children, to have offspring. So interesting stuff that we've been finding in humans over the last half a decade, century, girls are able to have are starting to be able to have kids younger and younger. So we're having a shift in when um, puberty is hit. So instead of it being 15, 16, 17 years old, we've got, we've got girls that are able to have kids now at like 7, 8, 9 years old. I mean, it's crazy. But is this, it's not progenesis, but is that some kind of a step in the direction of progenesis, where if the individuals in the population start being able to reproduce at a younger and younger and younger age, does that eventually lead to the locking in of more juvenile characteristics and less development of what you have in adulthood? I don't know the answers to these questions. I'm just speculating. Or just a side effect of improved health care to deliver the children from children. Is it is it that or I mean it's not it's not just that um, health care is allowing that to allowing it to have the babies to have babies <laughs> more successfully, um, but it's 
you know, it, a lot of people are, are wondering exactly why, but it's girls able, you know, they're starting their period younger and younger and younger. And that's not, you know, just having kids. It's the actual maturity of their sexual organs happening earlier. Um, Could it be a chemical contamination from all right. sorts of... Look right. Sorts? The plastics, the estrogenic compounds that uh, that are getting in all over into our food Soy and water. Mm -hmm. Also, pharmaceuticals that uh, people are peeing out into our water supply. Um, there's 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 all sorts of stuff that we don't even know what kind of effects it's going to have, or if it all if they all are already having effects. Oh. Um, Dissolve has an interesting point. Maybe genes will be less likely to be damaged if they're passed on earlier. And that's something that um, that people talk about a lot in uh, the sense of there are a lot of a lot of people also waiting longer to have babies. They can have babies from very young, but they're waiting a long time to actually have babies. So over that waiting period, what's happening to the chromosomes in the female's eggs, uh, what's happening to the, uh, the chromosomes in the stem cells for uh, the male sperm. Um, it's suggested that a lot of the chromosomal problems with offspring uh, that, that occur later in life is because of the fact that you've waited so long and your DNA is just getting damaged from waiting around so long or in the case of men, from dividing, 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 dividing so many times in your lifetime. Yeah, Fox in the Wire says, well, technically every female human is born with all their offspring already inside them. Yes. I, would, I am a multitude of individuals. No. <laughs> <laughs> that explains some personality shifts over the course of a month. Possibly. <laughs> so many people inside of me, they've all got to come out at some point, some point in time, right? Reminds me of the episode of Star Trek Next Generation when Data had an entire civilization of personalities inside him. Yeah. I haven't seen any of those shows in so long. Maybe that's something I should start downloading again. Star Trek... Oh, Samuel Penn shared a link to the Hotel Death Ray Daily Mail. That's what it was. Samuel Penn shared the link. The Las Vegas Hotel Death Ray. Let me see if I can get this page open. Open, open, open. Leaves guests with severe burns. Yeah, the Vidara Hotel. So here, okay, here it is, here it is. Let me, uh, let me embiggen this and see if I can do a screen share to share this because this is a fantastic, uh, fantastic image of uh, what, what is thought to happen with the hotel death ray. And by the way, this is the Vidara. I don't know if they have fixed the problem. This was some time ago, so... This article was back in oh, 2010, so maybe they fixed it in the meantime. Um, but yes, here we have sunlight coming in, bouncing off the south side of the property, reflecting into an approximate 10 foot, foot by 15 foot area, which moves as the Earth rotates. I love this infographic. That's awesome. Thank you, Sam Penn. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not a death ray, but maybe just a, ouch, I got more burned than I expected ray. Or an ouch, it hurts to look at the <laughs> side of the building. It My hurts! Eyes. Don't look at it! My eyes! Oh. That's why you should stay inside and avoid the giant unshielded thermonuclear reactor. <laughs> That's right. Avoid, or at least if you go out sunbathing, make sure to wear your welding goggles. 
<laughs> Number 14, correct? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um... I'm just checking the YouTube feed to see what it tells me. What's happening with YouTube? Nothing much. Nothing much. Need to figure out how to promote this on YouTube. YouTube Live, everybody! Woohoo! Um, Dissolve is asking political questions. Who is the better candidate for Prez this time, Obama or the other guy? Hmm. I'm not going to answer political questions. I have an opinion, but I'm not going to answer that. I like Obama because he, uh, he he appreciates science and promotes science a lot more and better, and he uses science more in his govern governing than that other guy. So that's why I like uh, that's that's that's. My preference, I like people who use logic and science. That's, that's my promotion there. I like governmental systems that have more than two options. I do, too. That doesn't happen here that much. It's not anymore. Uh, Janisku7 is asking in the chat, chat room, uh, can we engineer new life forms? People are working on that. Synthetic biology is all about the idea of engineering new life forms. So can you, you know, can you take the genes from different organisms, put them together in a new way that gives you a new life form that is similar to other things, but a combination of them, kind of a Frankensteinian uh, combination? Or can you actually develop genes in the lab? Can you develop proteins in the lab that you can insert into organisms so that they uh, that they do stuff you want them to. I mean, we have organisms that eat nuclear waste, but you know, they, are they really doing it efficient, efficiently? Do they reproduce as well as we want them to? Can they break down nuclear waste at a pace that was really helpful to us? Maybe not naturally, but can we enhance that using synthetic engineering? And I like that idea. Um, the, the question is, uh, Dissolve is asking, will they take over the world? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, the likelihood of something that eats nuclear waste taking over the world that you, des that you engineer to be a little bit better at eating nuclear waste, you're just making it more uh, efficient in that particular habitat, the habitat that contains nuclear radiation and stuff that, that it can eat. Um, it's not going to find that kind of stuff everywhere, and so it won't be able to take over the world that way. And so but you with all the radiation, it'll be exposed to lots of opportunities to mutate for copying and damaging errors to the DNA. And all right, devil's advocate, okay. <laughs> there is, I mean, there's definitely a conversation to be had about this, um, but we can't stop uh, mutations from occurring naturally in organisms that already exist on the planet. Um, so is it, is it bad? Here's the question that should be posed. Is it bad for us to try to do what nature does? You know, give organisms a chance to, uh, to exist and evolve. It's called breeding. Right, right. But, you know, we... Solozyme does that with their uh, algae. They just mm -hmm. take out samples and break them up into separate groups and see which one does the best, and they pick that group and divide it up and continue breeding and select for the features that they want for the type of oils that are produced. Right. They're not, they're not modifying the DNA directly. They're just rapidly breeding because... What That's, what the yeah. <laughs> That's what bacteria do. That's what algae with, do. With yeah. the rapid lifespans for dividing for the algae, it's a very quick breeding process versus cattle. Uh, someone in the chat room is saying something is fundamentally wrong with making living creatures from scratch. And but he's 
but saying, I can't explain why. So you're having an emotional reaction to the idea of making living creatures from scratch. Um, another person says that it's absolutely not wrong, in their opinion. Um, so we have these two opposed opinions. Um, and I think that people should really examine why they have their opinions in this way. And like, like you were just saying, Jeremy, it's algae, bacteria, they're going to breed, they're going to reproduce just like cows do, just like chickens do, just like people do. Um, they just do it at this really rapid pace, which is why they've been great for research for so long, because we can do all sorts of stuff in the laboratory with bacteria, algae, and yeast that we can't do with more complex organisms. Um, and so a twit refugee is saying uh, science is learning new things, not determining what is right to learn or what is wrong to learn. So that's, a, that's another interesting point. Science is learning that it can do things, and then it is society who needs to determine what is right or wrong in the application of those abilities, right? So uh, should, science, should science be able to um, figure out how to create new organisms from scratch? Should we be able to take the genes from just this alphabet, this, uh, if you think of genes, I, I'm going to, so think of it this way, that every organism is a product of the Lego-like building blocks that are contained in the DNA, in their DNA. Our DNA is a bunch of Lego building blocks, um, and we've gotten a lot of those Legos from other organisms, bacteria, plants, our own ancestors. Um, there have been, there's been another, a number of sources where these Legos have come from, and ta-da, here we are, right? And so what we can do, understanding that these Legos can be taken apart and put together in all sorts of interesting combinations once you understand how they work together, you can take them apart and put them together and build something new in the laboratory. And sometimes those things work and sometimes they don't. We've seen that happen through evolution. You have organisms that don't make it past uh, gestation, organisms that don't make it past early development. Some succeed very well and um, become entirely new species. And so if you just think of us as the product or even bacteria as a product of all these building blocks, does that make it less wrong in your head? Does that change the way that you think about it? The question then, once we know that we can do it, is how do we apply it? And that then is a question for society to answer, right? Do you have an answer, Jeremy? You are society. I am society. <laughs> I am all society. Okay. You are all society speaking for the world. <laughs> uh, let's see. Dissolve said, let's see. So we have um, a twit refugee saying genetic engineering is bioengineering. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, Dissolve is saying, so this is veering toward cloning. Um, yeah, I don't think that cloning is wrong either. There are many organisms that actually do uh, clone themselves. We clone ourselves when we have twins. You are producing clones. Maybe not a clone of you, but if you have identical twins, those twins are clones of one another. Um, plants produce clones all the time. Um, yeast bud a clone. Uh, there is... Cloning is not, you know, a bad thing. It's just a process of reproduction. Um, well, experimental cloning might not be as successful as those organisms cloning themselves. Yeah, yeah. We don't know how to do it as well experimentally as nature already knows how to do it. Yeah, you know, we. It's. I think that's a really interesting point. But, you know, it's a. It's our science is still very, very far behind what uh, nature has already figured out. Uh, but Fox and the yeah. Wires... Oh, go ahead. Huh? 
nature didn't have to think about it. It just tried everything, and what worked survived and stayed, and what didn't work died. Yeah, because there's... It didn't have to clean up the mess either. Something else came along and cleaned up the mess. Some organism would come along and eat the carcass, and then the mess was cleaned up. Yeah, it's a, nature is a system uh, without morality, without any kind of judging of any kind. So that's No intent. Is. No intent, right. Yeah, no intent, no morality. That's what we're all about. That's what we do. And, you know, it's good that we have our morality. Um, Fox in the Wire says, science is not about such subjective and personal issues as what is right or wrong. It's about learning truth and broadening our knowledge and wisdom. The way I see it, learning can never be a negative thing. Um, yeah, Dissolve was saying, saw that mitochondria used to be a single-celled organism. Exactly. We engulfed them and now they are so, mitochondria are so necessary to our existence. Um, Fox and the Wire is also saying, besides, DNA is insanely similar to a computer programming langui language. Last week, researchers were able to actually do some kind of uh, digital uh, read-write, like rewritable DNA. Excuse me. Um, I think I don't, I don't remember the, the specifics of the study, but I mean... They changed the DNA and they would change which color the mm -hmm. proteins produced. Right. I don't remember more than that, though. Yeah, so we know that DNA can hold information. Can you actually rewrite the DNA and actually have it still work? Like, once upon a time, we had CDs and DVDs that you couldn't rewrite, and then, oh, wow, now we can rewrite them, and they work. Um, Space Bats uh, saying, science has the responsibility to decide what is right and wrong in how we obtain information. Okay, I think that's an interest. I think that's also interesting because we've seen experiments not very ethical in in nature, right? Experiments on people that we've done in the past, experiments on animals that people are still uh, you know, questioning. See those, that article with uh, I think it was in Wired of the pictures um, that Darwin I think was doing of electric shocks to different muscles and making expressions on people. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Were pretty funny. Okay, let me let me find that. Let me find that article that I want to share that. <laughs> I forget what it was called exactly. Yeah, I saw it somewhere. Um, shocking faces. Let's see if I can People say they won't shock others for cash, but do. That was a, uh, the first first result from... Uh, <laughs> I looked for wired shocking faces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Darwin's creepiest experiment brought yeah. back to life. This is the one. Here we go. Uh, okay, Darwin's creepiest experiment brought back to life. Let us screen share. All right, should I embiggen? I don't think it's that creepy. I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> I don't think it's creepy either. But I think it would probably be uncomfortable to have parts of your face shocked. Yeah, so in a physiology lab that I, I've taken and also taught... Um, you were we, shocking people? Yeah, it's part of the experiment to understand how, um, how nerve conduction works and how muscle contraction works. And in the experiment, you set up um, electrodes, uh, basically, and you have, um, like what Darwin has here with these electrodes that he's sticking on the face at different points, um, conducting electricity. We had uh, little little connectors that we, uh, like... Hopefully not alligator clips, because that would... Not be alligator nice. clips, no. We had, like, a, a conductive paste and uh, just little little tabs that you stuck in the conductive paste. And you had to uh, find the point over the nerve that would get the best uh, gastrocnemius muscle contraction. And so you'd have... We had students lying on 
lab benches in the lab face down uh, with these wires on their legs and uh, their their calf munched muscles twitching twitch 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 and you know we had a few people who were laughing and going turn it up I can take more and so they turn up the frequency and the intensity of the of the shocks of the electrical uh, <laughs> the electrical shocks and see what happened. This is interesting. I mean, it's not really painful either. Uh, it depends on how much. You can do very low voltage, uh, low current um, shocks and, and get a, a muscle contraction. Uh, you, it, it has to do with where, if you're hitting a nerve, are you just hitting the muscle? If you're just hitting, if you're just, if you're hitting a nerve, you can use less um, less stimulation. If you're hitting the muscle, you're going to need more stimulation to actually get a response. He's easy. That one, I like this face. <laughs> His faces are awesome. Oh, look at my eyebrows. Here's another one. Wait. Ah! <laughs> Who wants to do this experiment? Let's do it. Yeah, these are... But here's a, the, the question. Are you willing to do it to Kai? Am I willing to do... Not right now because he's too young to understand, but I would be willing to do it to Kai, uh, my son, uh, when he's older and can consent to it. I would have... Be, I'd say, okay, you know, and then we could... We could show him what it feels like to be shocked on like his hand or his, you know, twitch a muscle in his, uh, in his leg or something that is not the face and then say, okay, let's try it. And make sure you teach him about how safe the low power shock is versus sticking something into the AC outlet. Yeah. Or he'll be... try and do the experiment himself with wires pulled from a lamp. Yeah, we'll try and educate on electricity before we do this experiment. <laughs> Let's learn how electricity works generally. Okay, these are wires, this is the plug, this is blah, blah. We'll get through all the details of electrical conductance. And then we can say, and did you know that your nerves work almost exactly the same way, except using, uh, using ions for conductance? Did you know? And you can you can compare. Of course, Kai's going to say no. I didn't know wires, that. Conductivity in the nerves. Great. <laughs> the fox in the wire says that's a good science, Mama. I experiment on him on my son too. Yeah, exactly. Scientific experimentation on the children. <laughs> that's why you went through all that nine months of having the parasite is so that you have someone to experiment on. Right. I know. I'm like I'm just waiting. I'm like okay. Wait till he gets a little bit more cognizant of of what I'm attempting, so that he. I do think consent is important, so he can go. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. I mean, I can't wait to do things like um, there's the video online, a dad using a rocket to pull out his son's tooth. It's one of my one of my favorite ways to remove a loose tooth I, that I've ever seen. Uh, or or a remote control car, you tie a string to the tooth, a string to your car, and vroom, so we can have fun with. <laughs> Can't wait. Can't wait. Maybe it's just that I've had so many teeth pulled that I don't really think that's going to be fun. But that just might be me and my dentist. I don't like them. Yeah, but you know when you're a kid, I don't know if you remember, but when you're a kid and you've got that that loose tooth that you're like you're flicking with your tongue and it's almost all the way out and it's only attached by this little tiny bit of gum tissue and you just but it, you don't want to pull it out but if you had somebody who could just yank it out really fast for you that would do it it's like pulling off a band-aid so you can do things to make it fun like a rocket I mean a rocket is how how much better we'll pull it out really fast <laughs> Well, I didn't get many, a whole lot of opportunities for that since I had six of my baby teeth pulled by, at the dentist. <sighs> that sucks. And then three adult teeth. And then the wisdom teeth. All four. Ah. 
You've had a no fun tooth life experience. Mm. Mm. My dentist is a little inept. One time he uh, stuck the needle for the anesthetic clear through my gum and squirted it out onto my tongue. Ow! What? It didn't hurt. It's surprising it didn't hurt, but it just didn't taste that good and <laughs> you're surprised that it happened. Like, oh, whoops. Yeah, that's pretty much it. After seeing I that agree. one, the cutaway skull of all the teeth from last week, Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm surprised he managed to get through with the needle, through the gum. Like, right. where would there be room? Where's there room? But somehow he there managed was, to do it. There was some little hole in the tissue somewhere, some little soft spot, and he just went right into it. Yep. Everybody's different. It's good. Um, somebody, somebody said... Uh, I'm not going to use electricity to get my child to eat broccoli. No. <laughs> there will be no electro electroshock therapy. <laughs> will you use that, uh, what is it? The one, that one flavor compound that removes the bitter taste from whatever you eat next. Or yes. Will you use that to get rid of the bitterness of the broccoli so that he eats it when he's younger? Oh, uh, we could do that. The problem is, that's actually, it. the... Like the chewable tablet isn't that tasty. Maybe was, that's a good idea. But I don't know if I can do that every time. <laughs> Here, eat the miracle fruit. Here, have broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> broccoli and miracle fruit sauce? Yeah, right. Instead of cheese sauce, it's just miracle fruit sauce. Uh, Fox and the Wire says, my son has this thing where he likes to experiment on dead bugs and try to bring them back to life. I would prefer that, you know, to the opposite. I mean, at least he's trying to bring things back to life as, as opposed to, like... Well, how'd they get killed in the first place? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe your child is the next Dr. Frankenstein. Fox and the Wires. Um, Twit Refugee says, am I familiar with Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor? I am. I've read her book and I've seen her TED Talk and she she is pretty amazing. Uh, if people out there haven't heard of her before, Jill Bolt Taylor is a uh, neuroanatomist um, who suffered a stroke and because of her her awareness of what different brain regions do, at least what we know of, of what different brain regions do, she was able to have a lot of awareness about what was happening to her at different stages of her stroke. And her book, A Stroke of Insight, and her TED Talk are really interesting because she discusses those. Um, it, in the way that she presents it, she, uh, in the TED Talk, I think it, it loses... I don't know. For some people, it gains a lot in the kind of um, spiritual, in a, in a very spiritual sense. Uh, and then the book, she has goes into a lot more detail that she's not really able to do uh, like she does in the talk because the talk, you only have like 18 minutes for a TED Talk. Um, but it's a, she talks about how it, she realizes like all this connectedness tied to that kind of stuff. Oh, our, we're, we're all very connected and like I don't know if she really compares it to a lot of uh, drug trips like ayahuasca and um, other hallucinogens that uh, people use to have certain spiritual like experiences um, and what it really gets at though is that our brain is definitely a filter and our brain uh, allows us to have our sense of self and our sense of who we are. Our sense, our, our brain separates us from the rest of the universe. Our brain makes us individuals. We are in, we are encased in our bodies um, because of our brains, because of our sense of proprioception. So in uh, the book and in the talk, she talks about leaning against the wall as she's having the stroke and losing a sense of 
where the wall started, where she ended and the wall began, and feeling as if she was a part of the wall, um, and ev seeing everything actually, becoming a part of everything, her, uh, her body expanding, her feeling as if her hands um, were and things were getting bigger and further away from her. And so what, in effect, was happening is the area of her brain that was responsible for proprioception and the sense of this is where my arm is in space and this is where I'm moving it and I know exactly where everything is. Um, the, scent, the part of the brain that's responsible for that uh, stopped working. And so when you lose that, you gain a connection that some people will call spiritual, uh, but with the rest of the universe, because you're no longer having a sense that separates you from it. So it's a really interesting, uh, interesting talk. I, being a scientist, think about it in a very reductionist manner. Other individuals get a lot of inspiration and uh, spiritual sense from what she's written. She had a very spiritual experience as a result of it as well. Um, I think it's it's either way you look at it. I think it's a her writing and her talk is a very valuable anecdote. I think it's really valuable and that we can learn a lot from it. Um, let's see. So Twit Refugee has put the uh, the TED Talk link in the chat room. Uh, Fox in the Wire is going back to his kid. Says he just finds dead bugs all over the place. So he's just looking for dead bugs. He's not going out and killing bugs. We don't have a serial killer in the makings. Um, it's be pretty quick at finding them since ants are very quick at cleaning up bug carcasses. <laughs> exactly. He's good. He's on the lookout. He's on the hunt for the dead bugs. It's much easier just to swat the bug and make your own <laughs> dead bugs. Don't tell the kid that. Um, Twit Refugee is saying uh, Jill Bolt Taylor was describing off the cuff. This is what he's off the cuff, how the left brain processes serially and the right side processes events with parallelism as many single events. And it could, he says he could have it the other, you know, the other way around, right? So you have the left brain processing, 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 um, processing um, one way and the right brain processing another. The two work together. If one of them stops working, you only have the other. Um, and then also, if, you, if a stroke happens that affects the way they communicate, you also have a, a changing of the way you perceive the world around you. Um, yeah, it's a really very fascinating, uh, fascinating book, facts, fascinating talk. Uh, Twit Refugee says, I was under the impression that the brain lobes were symmetric. Uh, so I got curious as to how the brain could act so differently but not be reflected in the tissue structure. Um, so at the macro level, Twit Refugee, the brain is absolutely, uh, you, you would call it symmetrical from the macro level. Looking at it, the two halves, the two hemispheres that we have, they look they're very similar. Um, but in the more microscopic structuring, you have, thing, have brain areas that are, of course, mirrored on either side of the brain. You have the frontal cortices, you have uh, the motor cortices, you have vision centers, um, the occipital lobe. You have all these things that are mirrored. But within that, within those areas, those centers of processing in the brain, things kind of get uh, moved around and they do things a little bit differently. So at the cellular level, uh, there is not absolute symmetrical uh, matching. Um, the two halves of the brain are actually very different when you get down to it. And that's one of the most interesting things about you know, how we are, who we are, and, our, and how, uh, how the brain functions. The two halves definitely are needed to make a whole. Um, you can't so function with a lot less, but... Still waiting for an explanation on why different individuals have the same brain function in the same spot? Why do the brains grow the same structures in the same locations and behave the same way from individual to individual? I think that arises out of the genetic, uh, the genetic instructions. So uh, we all come from the same basic genetic plan. 
and from that the genetic plan drives uh, the different tissues to uh, to build themselves up in a particular way and so I mean we we have a long way to go before we really understand how a stem cell for neural tissue goes in goes from just being a stem cell for brain tissue into being the brain I mean, we have I mean that's a leap of complexity <laughs> it's so huge we have no idea but we're beginning to learn that as that stems that, that those initial stem cells for the brain start to divide um, they start releasing different hormonal or endocrine factors that there's a local communication um, the cells around them start to differentiate accordingly based on these little local factors the soup that they're basically creating for themselves to grow in um, that leads different cells to grow in different directions to do different things um, but basically it all comes from the same plan the same underlying architecture and so that's what drives it to have the structure that it does uh, we all have the same structural instructions and so I think that's how that occurs but um, there are variations that do occur generally we have you know my uh, you know my um, Broca's area is in the same spot as your Broca's area there might be a little variation in its actual placement but pretty much in the same space um, and then you go from from there to the genetic differences and we're actually finding that there are genetic differences that are that have led to brains being set up in a different manner and so uh, study recently uh, showing that uh, sociopaths the soci sociopaths or psychopaths uh, I don't remember specifically which one the study was but they um, they did scans of I think it was sociopaths they did scans of sociopaths brains and found they were structurally different things were lighting up differently than uh, the normal people brains and so there are differences that can be um, seen and those probably arise from genetic differences in the very beginning that was interesting we're not all exactly the same uh, twit refugee <laughs> sociopath but I think they call them psychopaths now they're two so sociopaths and psychopaths are two different um, diagnoses they're psychologically uh, two different Bring, they're, they're two different psychological things I don't remember ex the exact differences but they are not exactly the same uh, Fox and the Wire sociopaths are people who can't physically feel guilt right mm -hmm. identity four says I knew a girl once who had half of her brain removed as a kid and it's interesting how well the other half learned to adapt and take over yeah you can have uh, a large portion of your brain half your brain gotten rid of and still be able to function you're not going to be entirely normal um, but you're you know one hemisphere can function very well to allow you to uh, to function in society did you see the one article about uh, autism and the sense of God or a sense of supreme being oh yeah that one is an interesting study uh, remind me again the, de the details uh, let's see. Oh, the autism uh, people who are autistic have a difficulty comprehending or anticipating what other people are thinking. Mm -hmm. And that ability, that lack of ability, means that that explains or correlates with a lack of belief in God. I can uh, put the link in the Google Hangout chat. Oh, here's the link. Cool. That's oh, Kai. Time for Kai. It's after two. I'm gonna. Ha I'm going to have to go here pretty soon. Maybe I can bring Kai in. I think he's gonna go eat lunch though. 
lunchtime. Uh, screen share. Oh, there's somebody at the door. So much happening all at, all at once. Kai's crying. Kai's crying because someone's at the doorbells. door. Um, so, oops. That's not what I wanted to do. Wrong window and begin. Uh, people with autism appear less likely to believe in God. Strength, strengthened theories that religious belief relies on being able to imagine what God is thinking. Capacity known as mentalizing. Hmm. So mentalization, the ability to mentalize, allows us to be able to have a belief in a personal God. Um, Ara Nora... Norin Zion of the University of British Columbia, Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Of course, this study happened in Canada. This wouldn't happen in the U.S. Why not? <laughs> I'm kidding. We reasoned that if thinking about a personal God engages mentalizing abilities, then mentalizing deficits would be expected to make belief in a personal God less intuitive and therefore less believable. And then... Uh, it's because the U.S. doesn't have as much funding for science? Is that why this wouldn't happen in the States? No. No. <laughs> no. Uh, let's see. The research, however, caution, the researchers caution that the findings do not prove that belief in God relies exclusively on mentalization. We cannot infer causality without further research. So what does this say, though, really? Like, what is this... Uh, what does this say? I mean, this says Nor and Zion's own research team has shown, for example, that analytical th thinkers are less likely, likely to believe in God. So what does this mean? Analytical thinkers are less able to mentalize and have, uh, have some kind of inferring of other people's intentions or beliefs and so uh, are more likely to be atheists. I mean, what is that? I think you're mashing two different studies together with that. Maybe, but I'm just trying to make a reach of, you know, what does this actually tell us? <laughs> what is this actually saying? Well, it's, that article is only about the correlation between lack of mentalization with a lack of belief in God. So it's just, yeah. It's... Mm. Mm. Study, I don't know. Uh, studies like this, I'm just kind of like, okay. I'll wait for other research to come out. I will wait. You'll wait for the research with electrodes where they trigger the mentalization and, and then ask if they still believe in God? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stimulate, stimulate spiritual experiences, exactly. Let's see. Oh, look, I just found the uh, Kevin Shoot watching and shared. First, first time to watch us on uh, the Hangouts on Air. Thanks for watching. Angelocracy Zoo um, has been commenting as well, said Obama killed NASA. I don't think Obama killed NASA. NASA has just had some issues competing. Yeah, Kevin Shute this is a free market did. I think there's a lot there. Oh, you would vote for me if I ran for Congress. Thank you. I appreciate that, Angelocracy. I appreciate your vote. <laughs> I'm not I'm not running for office. <laughs> Something not, I not even walking for office? Huh? Not even gonna walk for office. <laughs> 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 Uh, Fox and Wire says, just means the more logical you are, the more likely you are to understand that religion is highly illogical. No, I don't think that that's what the study is saying either. I do, that, yeah. People with autism are more analytical, which I think that is, um, they do look at things differently. Um, yeah, Twit Refugee says the science writer botched it. <laughs> I think the headline writer also botched it. Um, I don't know. I don't think that the uh, what the article was really saying was 
gotten really there. Uh, Dissolve says, can you see NASA TV online for the transit? Yes, we'll finish this once again with the Venus transit. I'm going to go, it's after two, I'm going to go hang out with my, my kiddo um, and try and get ready for this, this trip that I'm taking. But uh, Venus transit, yes, NASA TV, you can watch the Venus transit on, on NASA TV. And somebody said that CosmoQuest is uh, doing something with Phil Plate. So there's some interesting stuff. Um, interesting stuff out there. Uh, Jeremy, do you have anything else to add? Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Dissolve says, is NASA TV online? Yes, it is. NASA TV is online, and it's free for people to watch. It's uh, Just look for NASA TV. Uh, I don't recall it being a high-resolution video stream from NASA TV, but it yeah. does exist. Uh, it, like it exists. It's a postage stamp. Video. Yeah, and there are, there are other uh, groups also, Space Vidcast, CosmoQuest. Um, you know, there are there are lots of groups that are doing some uh, some fun stuff. So NASA TV is the basic place to look, but you can, you know, look for other, other places around the web who are uh, discussing and airing the Venus transit. And like Ulysses, I believe, was doing, said over in... Uh, Justin TV, uh, he's going to be hooking up with a local ast astronomy club chapter because they're going to be doing something. So you can always find out if there's an astronomy club in your area who might be having an event around the transit. Uh, you can always do a pinhole camera and a shoebox. That's right. You can always do that. You can do pinhole camera and shoebox. You can do, if you have welding goggles, you can use welding goggles to look directly at the sun. Use welding goggles. Use special solar glasses. Do not ever look directly at the sun. You can also use a tree. <laughs> if you look down at the ground, the shadow uh, of a tree, usually the uh, diffraction of the light from the sun through the leaves leads to multiple images uh, that you can look at in the shadow. Um, and Kai's babysitter watched the eclipse making a hole with her hand. She made a little hole with her hand or something with business. She did a little hole with a, her hand in a business card and made a little spot of sun on the ground that she watched outside the door of her building. So there are all sorts of ways that you can view the transit. Do you even have a scientific babysitter? For I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did, she's got tricks up her sleeves. You put that in the Craigslist article where you're advertising for babysitter. Must be scientific. That's right. Must enjoy science and like hacking ways to observe the sun without actually directly looking at it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm going to Kiki trust science. I do. I do trust the process that is science. And I love what's happening with science these days. There's some great stuff going on. Um, like I said, at Justin TV, I'm going to be probably be gone next week because I'm starting a vacation. So for a couple of weeks, I'm not going to be here. Uh, what sort of science are you going to do on the vacation? Going to go check out the volcanoes? Maybe. Science of volcanoes, the science of coconuts. <laughs> Fresh pineapples? You're going to go on a tour of one of the pineapple farms? Pineapple plantations. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. I'll figure it out. I definitely want to do some birding. I'm taking my binoculars. There will be birds. And the Peterson app on the iPod? Uh, iPad? I have iBird. I, I have, uh, we probably will take the iPad, but I have my, uh, on my Android, if we get, uh, if we have any cell phone connection where we are, uh, I, will I have the iBird app. I enjoy the iBird app. It helps me identify. iBird on your Android phone. Mm hmm iBird on really? my Android. Mm hmm That's What? That's a silly name for an Android app. Okay, yeah, you're right, but it <laughs> works. <laughs> it does work. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. This is fun. It was. Yeah. Thanks for bringing up some cool stories. Everyone in the chat room, thanks for, for chatting and talking. Uh, I appreciate all your conversation in the chat room. I'm glad you joined in the conversation. Um, oh, Space Bats just joined. Hello, Space Bats. Goodbye, just goodbye, Space Bats. Um, 
I guess he quit and he joined. He quit and he joined. Anyway, I will be uh, social media-ing for probably the next week. Uh, and there will be there will be shows next week. But I, just, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this on the Friday. There's, I'm going to be out of town. Yeah. I'll keep people updated. I will be back eventually. It'll happen. <laughs> I have very vague... In a month. In a month, right. Yeah, maybe just in two or three weeks. But I'll let you all know what I'm doing uh, if you uh, if you just occasionally check out the the science interwebs for my what I do out there. I'll have news of what I'm doing, and then you can come back. Maybe I hope that I don't lose everybody by taking a vacation. Anyway, this week in science, Dr. Kiki Science Hour, Justin TV Science Chat, and here Science Chat Hangout. Uh, these are things that I do. Uh, I'm going to take a vacation for a couple of weeks, but they'll all be going on eventually again or continuously. Thank you for joining in, and I will see you on the interwebs. Bye. Bye-bye.